change lives, change lives, change organizations, change organizations, change organizations, change the world. It is really very special to be here. As Allison said, only 10 years ago, I was in your very seats. Um, and I didn't imagine um, that I would um, be up here in 10 years. So it's really exciting to share a little bit of the work that I've done. And I don't think I've ever said this to you, but Allison sort of alluded to it in the introduction. You really have been an amazing mentor to me, Bill. And you were the first person I saw in a business setting who was a really truly creative person blending those two worlds. And it gave me absolute hope and sort of uh, enthusiasm to figure out how to blend creative, uh, creativity and business in new ways. So I never actually have told you that, but I'm glad to give you a chance to say thank you now. So. Um, so I'm going to share with you a little bit of the work I've been doing over the past three years at Twitter. I'm going to start with uh, a story or really kind of delving into a lot of the uh, examples and information that connects Twitter and TV in interesting ways. Uh, then I'm going to give you the same sort of uh, pitch or challenge that I give to TV executives because I think it's interesting to hear that language and that challenge when we say what's the next two to three years about. And then finally, I'm going to share with you a little bit of the work we, we do with our most influential users of Twitter. Uh, this is a new uh, part of the work we do, working with everyone from athletes to politicians to musicians to executive directors of pro-social organizations to religious leaders, which is a new area for us. And it really speaks volumes about where Twitter's headed as it evolves and grows up and thinks about itself in the media space. So let me just start with what my team does. We do three things, really responsible for three things. Number one is we work with all of our media and entertainment partners to make sure they know how to use Twitter successfully to build their business and uh, to tell stories with Twitter. Uh, the next two pieces, though, are actually, I think, a little bit more interesting than that. Number one is we make sure that Twitter is indispensable to events, to every event on the planet, and that it is the engagement platform for those events. Now, events mostly means television. And you could call this the two-screen strategy. I actually think it's bigger and more interesting than just a two-screen strategy. But that's where you kind of put that piece of it. The third piece we do is that we're responsible for the quality of the content on Twitter. And again, this is a new uh, area for us that we've only taken on in the past year. And it really talks, says volumes about how we're thinking about ourselves as a new kind of media company. So those are the three areas of focus. I'm going to start first with um, a few numbers here to see uh, how many of you know Twitter well. And I'd like to make this interactive. So I think it's, I, I bet everybody's voices can be heard relatively well in here. So if you have questions as we go along, please uh, raise your hand. I'm also going to make sure there's room at the end. But it's, they've got a, quite a bit of um, data in here. So you may have questions as we go. So don't be shy. So I'm going to get you warmed up. What is 100 million? What number is that in relation to Twitter and its business? Shout it out if you guys know. Active users, yep, number of active users, 250 million of these a day, tweets, right? 55% of our active users use uh, mobile, so that makes a lot of sense, it's a very, very mobile, mobile platform. Some more stats, 40% um, of our users consume only, they don't tweet. That is exactly the right way to use Twitter. If you tweet, fabulous. But 60, the fact that 60% tweet is kind of mind-blowing. If you know the normal stats about how to get UGC and how to get user interactivity, normally you're getting 1% of people to interact with your content and 0.1% to create content. So 60% has blown the roof off of all of the old data that we ever had. But the fact that 40% are absorbing, consuming, reading tweets is absolutely a model that we want to encourage. We have over 400 million monthly uniques to Twitter.com. And we had 80 advertisers in September of 2010, and we're now up to 2,400. So a lot of growth on the platform. OK, so that's a little baseline. I'm going to give you a little overview of our Twitter and TV work. I've got a sizzle reel here, um, and I've got a bunch of other videos to show you as well. This is a sizzle reel that gives you a sense of how people are using Twitter on television um, over the past year, really. And just to frame a little bit, you know, why has TV become so important for Twitter? When Twitter was invented, when Jack invented Twitter, he wasn't thinking, I'm going to create an interactive TV platform. He was looking at asynchronous real-time communication. And for me and for those of us who've worked in interactive media and interactive TV, Twitter, I think this is such an interesting story about Twitter, it became, it has become that scalable interactive TV platform that I've been waiting for for 10 years, ever since I started to work in and around interactive television. Um, and this has been a lot of the story of Twitter is learning what its core strengths are, and letting the product reveal itself to us, and then moving as fast as we can to enhance and jump on those, um, on those 
hooks that make Twitter so special. So I'll talk a little bit more about how we've, uh, how we've gone about doing that. But here's a video to start, and hopefully we've got some hot sound. Oh, don't hear the sound. Oh, there we go. Great. Thank you. So what's your name? My name is Beverly McClellan. But now the idea, we've got to get rid of five people. I've got to get rid of two. Everyone's wondering what Gaga's going to wear. After the meat dress last year, we started a hashtag, hashtag what will Gaga wear. Send us your favorite tweets. And we got a trending topic for everybody following us on Twitter. It's are you for real? Hit us up, twitter.com slash 106 Park, and put are you for real in your tweet. says ARP means that the homeowner has to pay much more than they thought they signed up for. Be sure you follow me on Twitter so we can live chat during the shows. Allison Hayslip here, your official V correspondent and guide to all that is digitally awesome at The Voice. Join Jeff Probst at Jeff Probst, tweeting live right now and throughout tonight's Survivor episode. Top 10 trending topics on Twitter in the United States. Five of them are about this show right now. Unbelievable. And with me right now is Team Christina. They're getting in on the action. So if you want to tweet any of Christina's team directly, and I know you do, tweet them at their handles. Just go to at NBC The Voice slash artist. It is Book the Comedians, set in the Papa Doc era Haiti of the 60s. Graham Greene's ambivalent hero describes the Trianon Hotel he's returning to. been just about 1.3 million VMA-related tweets since the pre-show began. Lady Gaga is the top artist on our Twitter tracker with 1,200 tweets per minute, but Justin Bieber is not far behind with over 900. If you want to vote for any of the acts tonight using Twitter, go to twitter.thexfactorusa.com. Hey, guys, it's time for late-night hashtags. Here we go. Hey, I'm just going to stay home and watch The Bachelor and try to find all the chicks that get kicked off on Facebook. <laughs> So we've been keeping track of your tweets. You've been talking of the judges, an absolute storm. Take a look at this. Oh, it seems that L.A. Reid is the most popular judge at the moment. Can I first of all ask for a recount, please? Because that doesn't sound right to me. Um, irritating. Okay, start tweeting me, please. Okay. So we got... Simon on Twitter one week after that. He already believed in Twitter and understood the importance of it as a TV producer, but he had, wasn't tweeting yet. And that entire integration was kind of a, um, an effect, a sort of a mastermind attempt to get him on Twitter. Because sure enough, as soon as you publicly show the conversation about high profile people, it's amazing how that motivates them. So all right, I'm going to dig into some data here, because we are at the business school. And data drives a lot of um, how we think about things at Twitter. What we try and do is meld data with also just obviously a strong vision and knowledge of how the industry works. But this data helped shift our conversations on a very real basis with TV producers and TV executives. So what you're seeing here are tweets per hour about Pretty Little Liars, which is a show on ABC Family. It's oriented towards tweens and their parents. Um, and what's so interesting here, because again, like for those of you who've been interactive TV, you know if you talk to an, a creative in, in the TV industry around interactive TV, they're like, people just lean back and watch my show. You know, that's all they do, right? Like, and they're not distracted. Maybe they go to the bathroom during the break, but they're really just absorbing this beautiful thing I've spent hours and days and millions of dollars putting together. The truth is, they're actually synchronously tweeting exactly in time with the show. So every single one of these spikes corresponds to the East Coast premiere of Pretty Little Liars in its last season. Let's go into a specific uh, show. The East Coast, of course, dominates. This actually over-dominates compared to the West Coast. The population is about 80% are East Coast and Central. But we see a slightly even more deflated West Coast, because why are you going to get engaged? You know, you're not necessarily going to tweet as much if you, your stream has already shown you all the conversation about the show three hours before. But this, this, this detail is the same for every single TV show and event. The pattern, the spikes that are different, I'll show you a couple different examples, but it's always a 20 minute or so lead in, live tweeting throughout the event synchronously with the, with the show or the event, and then a good buzz for 20 to 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes after, but it's absolutely synchronous. So the data, the evidence here made everyone suddenly go, okay, Twitter is real time, the, engage, the scalable engagement is happening real time. What does that mean in terms of um, how we actually engage and call that audience uh, in and make sure they're using Twitter effectively. So one of the, one of the ways we think about um, Twitter is that it's really an EKG of attention. 
it tells you, it's like the heartbeat of a show or an event, it tells you exactly when people are engaged, when they drop their attention, what and why they got engaged, if you go back and actually look at the tweets. So this is the VMAs from this past year. We had a phenomenal number. They had about two to three million in 2010, and in 2011 it was 10 million. A lot of that was driven by Beyonce and the baby bump, which you can see at F. That's when she did the proper reveal of her baby bump. Um, I can't explain why people are so obsessed with that, but um, at least we know what they're focusing on. I'm going to come back to the hashtag what will Gaga wear. I've got an example to show you there. But again, these spikes all relate to specific performances. So as a producer, this is phenomenal information to go back and understand what happened, why it worked. In fact, writers in LA, they constantly pull up Twitter while their show, whether it's Modern Family, for instance, or any given sitcom or show, they'll pull up Twitter while their East Coast premiere is going, and then they sit there and yell at one another about why one line landed and another one didn't. They have the best, most immediate feedback loop you could ask for as a creative around how people are engaging with your content. So it's significantly impacted the way writers think about this stuff, too. OK, so this was a, a stat that we came up with a year ago after a lot of research that is also, the reason you're seeing hashtags on air so much, a lot of it is because of this. It was the simplicity of this finding. And when I started, the first year I was there, I was trying all sorts of things and had very complex ideas about how Twitter and TV could work. And a lot of the lesson I learned was just to simplify, I and mean, it's very much like Twitter itself, simplify down to something really simple and actionable. So the data is that if you simply do something like add a, add a hashtag on air, so you saw that little voice hashtag pop up, you will at least double, if not tenfold, increase the volume of tweets about that show. That takes you three minutes in the control room, costs you nothing, and you've just you know, lit up the word of mouth about your TV show. And of course, this makes sense. I'm going to get back into, I'm going to talk about ratings in Twitter in a little bit. But just from a common sense standpoint, Twitter is one of the most scalable word of mouth platforms out there. Word of mouth is one of the most powerful ways to drive people's attention and awareness of new products or shows. So if, you're, if, you're, you know, if your Twitter uh, stream is full of people saying, I'm watching the Grammys, it will hopefully drive you to tune in and, and look at the Grammys. So I'll come back to the Nielsen connection. But the simplicity of just the hashtag, um, it, it's the ultimate signal to the audience that the, that the producers know that you're talking about the show and they're encouraging you to talk about the show. The 10x we get to when you do more creative calls to action. So here are some of the best practices of the past year that are now pretty standard, especially for reality shows, any live shows, any shows with an unknown, unknown outcome, which is where Twitter is the best. So number one, put the hashtag on air. What The Voice does is they glow that hashtag up at the end of a performance or when the uh, coach has to make a final sort of elimination decision. They know at the moment where you're going to have an emotional reaction, that's when they should remind you to share your point of view. And just to kind of step back a little bit, the reason why a hashtag is so important is it's hyperlinked on Twitter. So when you see it in your feed, you just click on it and boom, you're suddenly in this huge, massive national conversation about that show. And it can tell you exactly why that show is so compelling and it's a great way to drive people to tune in. When you add a creative call to action against that hashtag, that's when you start to see the 10x increase. So yes, there are 250 million tweets a day. Obviously, people have a lot of things to say. That's, we're, we're only unlocking a tiny amount of the conversation. And we know that because when you ask somebody a question about a show, something provocative, which judge is your favorite judge on X Factor, do you think that contestant should have been eliminated, even simple stuff, a barrage of more content and higher quality content um, arrives. So you still need to prompt people. Showcase talent handles on air. Their followers, they're following spikes with, um, with a, a showcase of talent handle on air. And your talent are also your best advocates for driving tune in and awareness when they tweet about a show, which is also why we drive folks to live tweet about a show. I'm going to come back to this in a bit, too, because it's a sort of a new kind of content that we have on Twitter that I want to delve into. But this is sort of the state of the art. This is the basics right now. I'm going to soon get into where we want it to head, because again, this is just scratching the surface of, of where we want to be. So just to give you a little more evidence of why these things have worked so well, this was the Oscars last year. We got a hashtag. It was um, working with the Academy and ABC and um, you name it. It was a, a very complex process. The Oscars is, you know, it's the Super Bowl of, uh, for celebrity culture and, and movies. 60 million, I think it rated 60 million last year. So getting anything on air is really str a struggle, right? And what they did is they did put a hashtag during the bump out to the ads. And it was, uh, I knew that there were going to be three of them throughout the Oscars, and I only caught one to two because they were like that. It was clearly like somebody was like, okay, fine, put the hashtag in, but don't, you know, for a split second. With that tiny, like, you know, really hard to see inclusion, you still see the volume of tweets. These are tweets per minute about the Oscars 
that it goes up using the hashtag Oscars, it literally kind of the volume doubles just with that very simple, very light inclusion. Another example of uh, how the data that helps support this argument, this is around live tweeting. So Jeff Probst um, didn't live tweet. This is a really good example because they do two seasons in one year. So his spring season in, in 2010, or sorry, his winter season in 2010 versus his spring in 2011, no tweeting in the first one, and that's the tweets per minute about the show. Then he starts to live tweet. So he just gets on. He was even doing it from his virgin flights when he was on Wi-Fi saying, this is what it felt like at this moment in the tribal council, or I really felt this person was going to get eliminated. And suddenly, 4x increase in the conversation about his show. Not much time investment, but an amazing return on that, on that value. So a little bit more about live tweeting. Um, here are some examples now. This is becoming more and more common. It's not yet as common as I would like, but just having the talent live tweet the, with the show, for instance, Kyra Sedgwick live tweeted the closer a few months ago, asks, at, let people ask questions, tell them what was happening behind the scenes. Um, here's an example of an evolution of live tweeting towards parallel storylines. So what's happening here on Community there was a character, Annie, who was moving in with some of the other characters, and all of the characters had Twitter accounts that were being uh, controlled by the writers. And a parallel storyline that was playing out along with the actual on-air storyline, could, you could just receive it on your phone as you're watching the on-air piece. And it was beautifully done because it was per perfectly in character. Pierce, Hawthorne, of course, Chevy Chase, thinking it's Twitter as Siri and not knowing how to use it. And um, it, was just, it was just brilliantly done. It really opens up live tweeting, this idea that there's the t show that you're watching and then there's this unseen atmospheric experience happening around it. You can call it the back channel, you can call it the two screen experience, but from a creative standpoint, it's an amazing canvas to add and augment on that story and it's ultimately flexible. Twitter in its simplicity is ultimately flexible. So these are just the beginnings. I mean, I hope in a few years time, if we're revisiting this, we'll see the art form have advanced significantly. Okay, so I want to give you a sense, you know, when I meet with producers, often uh, there is, often they'll be on Twitter, but they may not, I mean, it's really hard for us to see that direct connection between Twitter and TV. If you're an expert Twitter user during the Super Bowl, you know to go to hashtag Super Bowl, or you know who's live tweeting it, so you'll go to their accounts. But for the average user, we have not yet successfully really tied these two experiences together. So I'm going to show you a visual that tries to capture the power of how Twitter lights up around television and why this is such a meaningful event. So what you're going to see is the pre-show from the VMAs in 2011. And you saw the hashtag, what will Gaga wear? So this is, we call those Mad Lib hashtags. And we first created them with MTV in the 2010 um, VMAs. And the hashtag then was, uh, if Bieber met Gaga. Um, so, for a young audience, for the, you know, the 12 to 24 audience that the VMAs is targeted at, this is like second nature, like Pretty Little Liars is a young skewing audience too. That volume of tweets for Pretty Little Liars outmatches NCIS, which is a top rated TV show. So this is the future of TV viewing when you look at that younger audience um, growing up. So what you're going to see is that clip of the pre-show, the hashtag, what will Gaga wear, and you're going to see a little number in the upper corner and it's gonna start at zero. It's gonna count the tweets using that hashtag in real time as they were happening on Twitter. And the screen is gonna fill up with little blue balls representing each tweet as it comes in. So don't worry, this is not what viewers saw when they watched the VMAs, but it gives you a sense of what was actually happening on Twitter if it had been overlaid on the screen. Totally insane, but everyone's wondering what Gaga's gonna wear. After the meat dress last year, we started a hashtag Hashtag, what will Gaga wear? Send right, us your favorite tweets. This is the first tweets. time anyone's ever seen right that hashtag. This is get real interesting. What, zero. Odd future, Wolfgang killed them all. Including Tyler, the creator. All right, here comes the tweets. Nominee. It's Tyler, I gotta ask. You've said some strong Look, things. I'm at the bottom. You are at the bottom of the Twitter tracker. What, what, and then they just start filling up. I'm at the bottom. But, and you're right below Bruno Mars. I'm a, I'm a I'm a failure. How, how do you feel about being right below? Uh, I, so, I mean, again, it's a really important you, indication of the user I'm behavior that, yeah, they're watching, <laughs> so, but there's this enormous flurry of activity so, so happening, absolutely attuned to the show in parallel with the show. You know, how do you capture that? What does that mean as a producer or somebody who's running a network or a media executive? This is how media operates now. I think there's lots of ways we can creatively harness that and show that in compelling ways, but simply from an audience and marketing standpoint, this is critical. So that hashtag trended within about four minutes, uh, and I think it peaked at 25,000 tweets within about 10 minutes or so. So um, it's amazing how quickly people will just cotton on to something. Okay, I'm gonna move on. All right, so. Lots of creative potential, lots of interesting stuff, but why does this really matter? If you're a TV executive or a media executive, what does Twitter mean to you? What's, 
Why should you invest anything in it? Well, uh, the most important reason is Twitter can drive your business. So we're working with Nielsen on the relationship between Twitter volume and ratings, but this is a study from about two or three years ago that Oxygen Media did. They had live tweets from the talent on air, they had the hashtag on air, and it was a brand new season of Bad Girls Club, a reality show. Uh, they had a last season baseline, they hadn't shifted their marketing, they hadn't shifted the, the production values, they hadn't shifted the show in any significant way. So I think it's fair to say the last season baseline's probably a fair baseline. A good, um, a good case there. So then they did this whole integration with Twitter for the East Coast premiere, but they dropped it for the West Coast premiere. And what you saw was an over doubling in the ratings. And the West Coast went up by just a small amount. So maybe that's our control. 9% might have been the normal growth. Then when they turned it on for the West Coast, we saw an almost 60% increase in ratings uh, for the show. So this is one show, a reality show, where Twitter is perhaps most powerful, but a really important initial lesson around how if you do this right, you absolutely can drive your business, business around it. So I mentioned we're looking and working deeply with, um, with Nielsen around this stuff. And um, God damn it, uh, data indecisions, which uh, was my nightmare class 10 years ago, I've actually been going back to it and um, uh, trying to remember my coefficients and my R squares because we're using R squares like crazy. So I really wish I could say don't worry about it, but you should worry, you should actually pay attention to it. Um, <laughs> So this is just an early example. We're not yet there with Nielsen, but the early um, information we have is they have a whole social buzz, mo buzz model that looks at blogs, boards, and posts, and public Facebook data, and the relationship between those entities and, and ratings. And they found a strong correlation. And it's mostly powerful, I think, four weeks and two weeks out. So what we've done is given them a bunch of Twitter data around 250 shows in the 2010 and 2011 um, time frame. And when you add uh, Twitter to that data, when you take out the social buzz data and you put Twitter in, the relationship gets even stronger. And so the early findings are Twitter, it does indeed help explain or it helps, uh, helps us understand ratings within a TV show. Now, how I, I really can't wait to get to the point where we can talk about specifically how Twitter volume might drive a certain percentage of, of Nielsen ratings, but that's still to come. One of the early findings are that the Twitter relationship, that R-squared, gets much stronger on the day of and really during the show, which is what we all know, that Twitter comes alive uh, during the show. So more to, more to come there, but that's, that's the reason why, you know, all this, it's nice to tie the creative rationale to an actual business reason that everybody wants to pay attention to. Okay, so that's where we are after a couple of years, and I want to share with you some of the ways I challenge executives to move forward with Twitter, because again, we've, we're baby steps into this. There's so much more to be done. So here are the three things that I ask people to consider and to, to kind of um, to challenge them with. Number one is to really treat Twitter as a peer to Nielsen ratings. That's a very provocative statement. People like to raise their eyebrow when I say that. Um, the other one is to the programmers. As I mentioned, Twitter is this whole, the whole two screens, social media as a whole, is this whole other experience that needs to be programmed similarly and with the same creative zeal as you program your electronic program guide or your network. And then finally, can we move into a phase where we're actually allowing the audience not just to weigh in or to acknowledge their tweeting about stuff, but can they actually change the outcome of these storylines? And with the election, this is the most exciting year to really be pushing this forward. I'm gonna show you an example, an experiment we did originally. All right, so for this one. So of course Nielsen is the standard, and we work with them very carefully and closely for a good reason. They are the blood pressure of television. But if they're the blood pressure, Twitter should be the heartbeat, because it really is, as I mentioned before, it really is that measure of attention. So I'm gonna show you uh, two different shows, and I'm gonna see if you can guess which ones they are. So you've, by now you're used to these EKG charts that we do. You have a show start and a show end. These two shows have the same Nielsen rating, they have the same, they have a similar primetime slot and they have the same demo. They're both younger skewing shows. And yet on Twitter, they have fundamentally different behaviors. So let's see if you can guess which is which. So first we're gonna have, it's gonna be a red and a green line. So the first show, green line, typical chatter before, peak as soon as the show starts. Something interesting happened there. Something really interesting happened there. Uh, a few more plot twists or changes, whatever it is. Show ends, a little, a little chitter chatter, and then it's done. Okay, here's show number two. Same size audience, remember. Boom. <laughs> Scales them off the chart, essentially. What is the show that has not only much higher volume, but way more plot turns? Can anybody guess what those two shows are? Or even give me a genre, how about that? You guys don't watch TV anymore, do you? <laughs> <laughs> 
close, close. What, what's the other one? Okay, so I'm, okay, so I heard a bunch of reality, so the red line is reality. Oh, sorry, oh, I just managed to disappear it. Sorry, we're gonna have to watch it, oh, there we go. All right, so the red line is X factor, and the green line is Once Upon a Time, which is a scripted drama, also young skewing, the whole sort of fairy tale thing on ABC. So the challenge to the industry is, okay, same ratings, and again, Twitter and ratings within a show, there's a powerful connection. I can, you know, we can work with Once Upon a Time to increase their ratings if we use Twitter in clever ways, right? But between two different shows, between genres, if you're an advertiser, if you're putting 20 or 40 million dollars into X Factor, or you're just you know, investing 20 million to Once Upon a Time, how should you be interpreting this? What does this mean in terms of your success as an advertiser uh, and the connection between you and your audience? This is one of those open questions that I'm hearing lots of things on both sides of the, on both sides of the, uh, the fold. So, one common concern I hear from advertisers or agencies is, but if they're tweeting, they're not paying attention to the ads. And first of all, they're all tweeting and they're gonna to continue to tweet, whether it's Twitter or other social media, engagement is here to stay. So let's get our heads out of the sand, number one. Number two, it's much better if they're tweeting because they are therefore more likely to be watching your show live because you don't wanna connect three hours later, you don't wanna PVR it, you're not having that two screen community experience that is so powerful to the viewer if you're watching it on Hulu and you've missed the whole conversation. So they're more likely to be watching it live, which means they're less likely to be fast forwarding through your ads. And even if they're on their laptop or more likely their mobile phone, they're catching your ad and they're more engaged. And now the opportunity, it's a door open to advertisers to say, well, how do I use these same mechanisms? How do I use hashtags? How do I use Twitter storytelling to engage in the ad itself? And they're already starting to engage in this way. The Super Bowl this past year, a year ago we had one hashtag in an Audi ad during the Super Bowl. This year, one out of every five ads had a hashtag in it. And again, that's just the basics of how do you engage people, just the hashtag. How do we get a call to action? How do we get something more exciting in the ad after that? So um, this I just find a really provocative and interesting question, and I think as uh, the networks and the advertisers and agencies figure this out, uh, it'll be interesting to see how it splits. Because the answer, the simple answer isn't advertise only on the most highly engaged shows, because Mad Men, Game of Thrones, there are plenty of shows that have strong Twitter engagement, but not at the X Factor level, and they're still very powerful advertising opportunities. Um, so it's not an obvious answer yet, but it's an interesting one to, to think about. All right, program Twitter like you program your network. So this is a creative challenge. You guys might have remembered about a year and a half ago, Howard Stern live tweeted private parts. It was an obscure airing at probably, I don't know, like 8 p.m. or something on the weekend, and it drove up ratings significantly. And it was the beginning of this concept of, hey, if you do a parallel storyline or you engage people in parallel to the airing as the insider talent, you can really drive awareness. Well, there's a huge opportunity here, right? People spend a lot of time casting the right people, thinking about their storylines, but they're forgetting there's this whole second experience that they need to be programming. So it's not just your normal EPG, it's what's the second storyline, the live event, uh, the live tweeting, the hashtag conversation, the fan engagement, what is it that you should be uh, programming alongside your shows to retain and hold the audience? So this is the future EPG that I would like to see. Um, by the way, this is an amazing stat, Comcast, um, uh, Comcast, so the EPG, I know, uh, you know, for our generation, the EPG is just a sign of frustration of like, with Google and the kind of search that we live in, how could we have such a linear, old school way of finding information? It's just, it's amazingly frustrating. And by the way, they're all working on really a next generation of this stuff. But despite the fact that it's this frustrating, it's just really important to remember when you go out and you have a mass market audience, Twitter has a mass market mainstream audience. Many of you will work for companies with a mainstream audience. Um, guess what, if, if the Comcast EPG was a web page, guess what ranking it would be in like the top 100 in terms of like daily views? Anybody guess? It's number four. I haven't validated this information, but it's phenomenal. I mean, people still watch over six hours of TV a day, and this is still the dominant way they look for content. So one of the important lessons for Twitter is, and I think it's really important for Silicon Valley, Yes, of course, we're trying to reinvent stuff and evolve things, but you have to respect uh, how long it takes for people to get there and that there are certain just owners of the space that you need to work with to figure out the transition points. Um, so it's always a stat that sort of amazes me. Okay, so this is the next one. This is the most exciting one creatively. How can we inspire and actually have the audience not just be chattering alongside or watching live tweets, but how can their input actually change the outcome? 
So here's something, um, well, so first of all, this has been happening forever, right? Like everything new is old. We've had interactive TV for 50 years, ever since you know, we've had call-in shows and we've had voting for over a decade now. So again, this is all stuff that's an evolution. It's not necessarily um, a brand new thing. This last quarter, we started to try a few things by having voting with the X Factor. So that being able to vote on Twitter is a sort of obvious way you'd want to be able to engage. But there's um, even more meaningful ways that Twitter can actually change uh, the outcome of a show. And in an election year, it's our best shot at really driving innovation. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of something we did with Fox News on the South Carolina debate. So the proposal to them was, how can we use Twitter to change the debate to elicit more information from the candidates? We don't want to pit people against one another. That's what the actual election is for in November, right, is choosing people. We're in the process, the most important part of television and the election uh, process of the next nine months is for us to get enough information to make the right decision, right? And Twitter is all about information. It's all about following your interests. So how can Twitter help make this debate more meaningful? So we came up with um, something we call a hashtag poll, where uh, the ask was you could use hashtag dodge or hashtag answer and the name of the candidate to decide whether to weigh in whether you thought the candidate was actually answering the question. The goal was to show that data in real time during the debate. So as Romney is dodging or answering, he can actually see that and then therefore either go deeper in his answer to try and accommodate the fact that he's seen, people think he's dodging or know that he can move on to the next question. Now, Fox was willing to experiment with us and I'll show you what actually happened. Uh, it, was, it was done uh, online during the debate and then immediately after we had the results. They weren't quite willing to go all the way. I'm waiting to, I think MTV will do it with us, but I'm waiting for a mainstream broadcaster to do it with us. Because I really think, even though of course it would change the outcome, it would hopefully very quickly um, get better and richer information out of people. So here's what they actually did. Participate through Twitter tonight. You can weigh in on how well the candidates are answering the questions. Tweet the candidate's last name and hashtag answer if you think he's tackling the question, or hashtag dodge if you think he's avoiding the question. But we're going to take a break right here. Remember to send your thoughts on how the candidates are about answering the questions via Twitter. Uh, tweet the candidate's last name and hashtag answer or hashtag dodge. Send me questions at, at Brett Bear. Include that hashtag SC debate. I don't know if your Twitter page is like mine. Mine is on fire. What have they, what's kind of been the consensus for the first hour of the debate? Let's take a look at this because this is very interesting. We've got the green line here for Newt Gingrich, a white line for Rick Santorum, and an orange line for Mitt Romney. Let's drill down on this and take a look at Mitt Romney, where the biggest dodges were perceived to be. First of all, his uh, answer and his back and forth with Rick Santorum on this issue of felons and whether or not they should be allowed to vote. People thought that he was dodging that, and look at the numbers here. And then on his tax records, he was seen as dodging that question so much that we couldn't actually record the number of people who were saying that he was dodging. <laughs> Foreign policy. Tweet me your questions. At that was a wild debate. People are nuts. Hashtag SC debate. After this break. At Mr. Whiteman. Has no child left behind so been a success? They sourced from Twitter with no failure. irony, by the if way, flattered, about the handle. What needs to be done to change it? I mean, I was Let's amazed. I was like, are they Roberts not aware they got four white guys on stage? And the audience really thought the candidates fair tonight. Hi, John. Hey. Newt Gingrich did very well on foreign policy. Mitt Romney, as you can see, below the line. I've got to tell you, he spent most of the night below the line. Rick Santorum, seen as giving good answers, as well as uh, Rick Perry. And Ron Paul, we've got to tell you, Ron Paul spent the entire night in oh, the good no, answer uh, section. And looking here at Newt Gingrich, Romney's record, he was a little more of a dodge than he was a good answer. The economy getting good points, race getting very good points, foreign policy pretty much the same thing. That's the way it came out tonight. So um, here's what we knew backstage. We were in the control room looking at this data and feeding it to them live in the hopes they would loop it into the actual debate. We knew within minutes what the headline of the New York Times was tomorrow, which was Romney is people's reluctant choice. Yeah, he might be the front runner, and that's why Gingrich surged for the next two weeks after. It's just people were like, ugh, it was so clear from the response that while he's respected, there's a real issue in his campaign. And we knew that the headline the next day would be the pressure on him to reveal his tax records. That was the story here. It was the single biggest dip. Um, and Gingrich, as coming up as having an actual shot, at least for a period of time, was apparent as well. So the power of this real-time data is really pretty phenomenal. Uh, and our challenge for this year is to find somebody who's really willing uh, to take that on and make it part of uh, the conversation in a meaningful way. 
Okay, just to pivot like mm, about 180 degrees, uh, we also work a lot with high-profile users on Twitter. This is the, the mandate to help figure out how to increase the quality of the content on Twitter. 250 million tweets a day. The question we're asking ourselves, that's great, that volume is great, but is the content any good? Uh, and this, again, speaks volumes about our evolution as a company. So here's a little bit of work that my team does. We focus a lot on making sure we have a lot of amazing tweeters and influentials on Twitter. 50% of the top 50 ranked TV shows are on Twitter. Almost 70% of the NBA, half of NASCAR and half of the NFL. Almost 90% of the Billboard top 100 musicians and 85% of the House and Senate and every single major candidate um, for president is on as well. So we look at these numbers, we try and make them go up, but more importantly than that, which was just sort of our baseline, is how do we get better quality content out of them? So here's, some, here's an example of why high-profile people on Twitter are so powerful. This is the Oscars from 2011. You might remember it. Your host for the evening, James Franco and Anne Hathaway. So I actually kind of almost missed it when he came out, but he's actually got his phone up, right? And this is what he was doing, and I'm a huge fan of the Oscars, and this blew my mind when I saw it in real time. He tweeted out his perspective on the Oscars. <laughs> Uh, so again, it's not just the back channel, it's not just the two screen experience, it's this whole 360 degree experience around events that social media gives us. And so our challenge has been to say, okay, 140 characters, Twitter is incredibly simple, but that also makes it the ultimate canvas for creative people. So my team has spent time looking at what naturally bubbles up on Twitter, helping spotlight the best content, and then innovating with certain partners, whether it's an athlete or a musician or a host, on new formats, new kinds of Twitter content. So here's just some of the experimental formats that we're working on. Ones that we know already work, as the data is there, are live tweeting. We just did a Grammys live tweeting, a 20 different bands live tweeting the Grammys. Why it wasn't live, I don't understand why they, CBS doesn't uh, move to a live model. I think that's another pressure Twitter will put on them. We've got the Golden Globes, the Oscars, the Emmys, they're all live. I think more and more of these major events will be live on both coasts. So for the bands who live tweeted the, the Grammys, the, at the 50% uh, mean, they saw a 4x increase in their daily follows. So it takes, you know, it's 10, 15 tweets, it's just doing what you'd normally do anyhow, probably, and yet you get this huge uh, lift in followers. Some of the more um, sort of newer ones are these parallel storylines. So working with HBO, hopefully in the spring, to figure out how could you add a parallel storyline to Game of Thrones. So it remains a hermetically sealed experience for the viewer, but there's still this great use of the 360 degree experience. Um, so a couple examples of this stuff, you can go to media.twitter.com to check this all out. So Eminem interviewed Yellow Wolf, who's one on his label. It was a, a classic way of how one high profile person can lift another high profile person's um, status, their followers, and help introduce his, uh, his new album. Um, Tom Petty, this is uh, uh, our music creative lead in LA, Tatiana, drove um, a Q&A with Tom Petty. She's uh, going to work with Paul McCartney next. Again, very simple models, but really rich information that comes out of it that, again, drives their follower growth. They get 20x their mentions. It really is its own form of programming on Twitter. Some of my favorite kind of odd ones, I mean, comedians on Twitter are phenomenal. They come up with new things all the time. I mean, John Hodgman woke up one day and decided to live tweet All Things Considered, which is brilliant and wonderful. And then Common and Mary J. Blige worked with the NBA. They were providing live commentary on the NBA. And this is sort of the beginning of an experiment that we want to try for the Olympics and other major sports events to get other people, again, this cross-pollination and making the world just become so much smaller uh, when all these different folks in the music industry can actually weigh in on sports. Um, so, and this, this all, again, we all tie it back to data. Why does this all matter? Well, we want the quality of the content to be better, and we look all the time at does it change core followers? Does it change our active follower base? Um, does it reward the high-profile users? And sure enough, when folks follow our best practices, they do see a significant uh, shift in their follower count. Just a few of these ideas can really shift how they, how they work on Twitter. So I'm going to end there uh, because we are almost out of time, but I want to make sure you guys have a chance to ask some questions. And you can see a lot of these examples, a lot of the best practices on media.twitter.com, which is where we go to scale this stuff. So why don't you guys tell me what you'd like to know more about.
Sure. So trending topics are tricky for me because everyone uses them as a metric of success, and they're not that. They're a metric of discovery for our users. So the algorithm behind it, uh, without sharing too much about it, it, it rewards newness, not volume. So one of the things that we've been working with on my team is to create uh, basically rankings that are truly based on volume, or at least the algorithm isn't, isn't user-focused, it's to reward actual uh, exposure uh, on air and integration. So Twitter TV rankings, for instance, you can find them at trender.tv. Social Guide has a bunch of them. Bluefin is a new company out of MIT Media Labs that is trying to measure and create a new kind of Nielsen's but of, of Twitter engagement. So we're constantly investing in and working with our ecosystem to build the things that we need to change and move the industry. Um, trending topics, um, if you've looked at discovery in the new Twitter, um, that's really designed to help people delve in and discover way more stuff, because you don't always know who you're supposed to follow. So trending topics is optimized to introduce new conversations, um, and it's something we work on all the time, too, because the folks who are tweeting, again, they represent 60% of the audience, but not 100%. So how do we broaden out that conversation to reflect more diversity? Diversity and discovery are a huge focus for us this year. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So the simple equation is more awareness of your show. So to get people to talk on Twitter. That drives the volume of people who actually watch the show, which gets you a higher uh, volume of advertising. Your CPM might stay the same. It may affect your CPM and send it out, but simply having more viewers is a direct correlation to your bottom line. So you mentioned that you guys have um, about 2,400 advertisers on Twitter right yeah. now. Um, I know that we can see in the trending topics, the top one is usually promoted. Mm -hmm. I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about how you're trying to incorporate advertisers um, into the Twitter experience. Yeah, absolutely. I was expecting that question to come along. Um, so um, in, in the advertising effort that launched about 18 months ago or so, really the focus has been to make advertising look and feel and act just like all the other content on Twitter. So it shouldn't feel forced, it's not added in. It's everything that is an advertisement on Twitter is either a tweet, an account, a trend. So it's just, we make, we're very transparent about promoting and making sure people know why it's in that position. Um, but it's important that we didn't introduce a whole new form of content. We really wanted to crack a, a code on a different kind of advertising. So it's been phenomenally successful to date. We've had unbelievable engagement rates. We have promoted tweets, uh, promoted trends, as you described, promoted accounts, and we now have promoted tweets in timeline. And that's really going to unlock the scale in our advertising model uh, so that you're not just having to go to the homepage, look at the promoted trends, or you don't have to rely on search. So all of the indicators there are, are really, really strong. And really, the model here is how do we make advertising as engaging and natural as possible? And so that's why all the measurements of our advertisements are based around engagement. So it's the same way we look at all the work I do, all the earned media that we do uh, with uh, high profile users or, or TV shows. It's the same set of best practices as the paid media that you can buy on Twitter. So how many retweets did you get? How many follows did you get? Did somebody click a link in, in, the, in the promoted tweet? And those engagement rates can go as high as 50%, which is again, blows off the doors of all advertising model. We had a Volkswagen ad that had a 50% engagement rate uh, in its promoted tweet spot at the top. Um, Normally, they're around 10 to 15 percent, but we often see those sorts of spikes. So it's been, um, it's, it's been a really interesting process of a gradual introduction to make sure we respect the user experience and get enough feedback on what works. Um, but as you can see, more and more hopefully very effective and interesting and useful ads uh, come into your timeline. You'll see that the, the, the revenue model is scaling with that. We'll go Hi. There, um, thank you for your talk. You yeah. talked a lot about the current engagement, which is essentially from television back to Twitter, and I was more curious about what you talked about towards the end, which is uh, traffic from Twitter changing the TV viewing experience and changing the storyline. And I was curious about what some of the other ways you might be exploring are, say, changing time allocation to candidates based on mm. Twitter feeds and so on, and also what the challenges are from TV producers who are probably, you know, not too excited about it at first. Yeah, well, the biggest challenge from the production standpoint, and we're working with The Voice on this stuff, and we worked with X Factor, is it changes the format. 
and formats are, you know, there's a whole bunch of money and time invested in a very specific format. So um, any of this stuff, even getting a hashtag on air is kind of amazing because that stuff is so carefully thought through and uh, carefully done. So certainly the big challenge, this is why you have to understand TV production to do this role. And every one of my team comes from the field they represent. So Tatiana came from Hollywood Records, was a music, uh, is a musician and was a music journalist. Omid worked at CAA for 10 years as a talent agent. Uh, we have folks from, uh, from book writing who are actual you know, current authors. We're hiring people from TV, et cetera. So understanding the constraints is absolutely vital to be able to pitch the right idea and not get laughed out of the room. Um, so yeah, it's really a challenge to get them to let something so unknown change the show. It's, it's scary. It's definitely scary. But the more people who decide to innovate and try with us, we get this little, everything is a little step, like the hashtag dodge answer. Finally, at least you can see what it could have looked like. And now a producer can say, ah, I kind of get it more. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll be the one that for the commission on presidential debates in, in uh, September and October, maybe we'll get a chance to rethink the town hall there. Um, but it definitely, it definitely is a struggle. And it's mostly, I mean, we can really only have this impact in live shows or live events, because obviously if it's pre-scripted, you're not changing the outcome. The other way around it for, for a scripted show, though, is, for instance, you can have prize money. We have something called Flock to Unlock. And that concept is, hey, if we hit a million tweets during the show, we're going to double the prize money for, say, Celebrity Apprentice, or double the, you know, the donation that's going to go to this sort of uh, nonprofit that's being a, a supported in Celebrity Apprentice. So there are ways around it, um, but really, it's, I think the idea is to focus on if the places where it, you're strongest and figure out the most um, impactful thing there. And then what are the very simple practices for the rest where, like a scripted show or drama, that isn't going to take too much time? I hope that answered the question. Let's go here and then I'll go back up. Yep. Yeah, gaming is interesting. I thought you were going to ask about movies, and we've definitely seen studies out of various universities that there's a correlation between Twitter buzz and the box office ranking on that first Friday, which has sent a lot of movie studios to us. Um, gaming is tricky, right? Because um, it's a shared experience, but it's in the sort of time-shifted way, and sometimes it's a shared experience for a small set. We have been thinking a little bit about it. We haven't invested as much time because it just isn't, doesn't hit all those sort of primary buttons of, is it a massive shared experience that has an unknown outcome that everyone can get access to? But certainly things like Xbox, the way that technology is moving, the way you could have gaming elements play out onto Twitter and come back in. I think there's a lot of creative potential there. It's one of those areas we keep being like, ah, we need to focus on it, but we just haven't had the bandwidth yet. Oh, yeah. 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 The tricky part, one of the pieces that we struggle with is not everyone wants to constantly send tweets out about what they're doing. Like, you know, some, some of the obvious ways you could hook it in saying, hey, I just got to this level, or do you want to come play this with me, can feel spammy in a, in a Twitter feed, unlike it does in a Facebook feed, because it's so much more about reputation and the value of the information you're putting out versus pure social connectivity, which is more Facebook's uh, mantra. So it's tricky for us to balance that line of what's the most high value you know, what's useful information that can be a byproduct of a game that still adds to the Twitter experience? Yeah. Um, could you speak a little bit more about uh, Twitter's hopes or plans to change democracy? You know, are you guys, like, are you guys <laughs> hoping to elicit more transparency? Or what, do, what do you yeah. hope to bring from showing that kind of public reaction to a candidate's uh, presentation at a debate? Sure. So, and, and um, as you guys know, we had a per country takedown announcement a couple months ago, which we can talk about too. Um, so the, the essential sort of mission, I would say, that, that Twitter, that the executives at Twitter um, try and maintain and, and um, uphold is this essential belief that the more information that's out there and the more dialogue that happens, um, the smaller the world feels. This is something Jack often describes. He's like, if you can be sitting in um, Milwaukee and be watching tweets about Egypt and Tahrir Square, it just shrinks the world down. And that shrinking of the world down has to lead to better understanding and more empathy. Where that leads is up to every individual actor out there to do something interesting with it. Twitter is not responsible for the Arab Spring. That was a set of amazingly brave people who went out and did stuff. They happened to use Twitter to help push that message. But that's powerful to even be that sidekick, that platform that allows people 
to take a mission and grow a movement out of it. So there's this essential belief that information wants to be free. The more information we share, the smaller the world becomes, and that can lead to incredible opportunities. So the election, yeah, I mean, my mission isn't to, is not, I mean, I might have a personal opinion, my mission is absolutely not to drive one candidate ahead of the other. It's just to get more, enough information out, useful information that people can make the right decision come November. So everybody who advertises with me now wants me to tweet <laughs> as yeah. part of the campaign. And then there's organizations like Clout who give weight to certain uh, individuals. Uh, is this a threat? Well, tell me more about what you do. Who are you? Why would they want you to tweet? Um, okay, <laughs> well, so uh, I run a company called Viumbe. We're best uh, known for owning and operating e-bombs world. And so young males tend to be traveling flocks. And, you know, if we're doing a campaign for a car and we can say, hey, you know, look at this car running off the cliff, this is fantastic, you know, you won't die, or whatever it is, as silly as it might be, they love it. I have no idea if there's ROI, but they love it. They're just like, and then people like Clout, you know, are saying, I'm more worthy than this individual. I, I don't know. Is this a threat to your business is and Clout the work that you have? Is Clout a threat? Clout, and, you know, me, I'm making money because I can tweet. And, and drive more awareness yeah, to your, exactly. yeah. I mean, that's the very essence of Twitter is to help redistribute traffic and um, awareness around Twitter. And by the way, you'd get even more traffic if you bought a promoted trend or a promoted tweet to help drive awareness. Um, but absolutely, I mean, Twitter is all about earned media and paid media. We've, had, we've been an earned media uh, experiment and, and, and incredibly effective one for a long time. Uh, that's what makes Twitter so addictive. You can, there's a lot you can do. This is what makes Twitter special. You can add great quality content to the network, which is great for us, and it helps you. It drives traffic, drives awareness. Twitter gets stronger, your business hopefully gets stronger, and then you can also now um, pay for that placement because you're only ever going to reach a certain number of people without that extra paid. Even with Lady Gaga with 17 million followers, you know, we've got 100 million plus actives. Like, there's way more of the world to reach than you ever could with earned media, which is why we have the paid model as well. But absolutely, that's, I, mean, I think a lot of Twitter's story has been also balancing it out and understanding what's the essential value that it provides, how do we retain that, because that's part of its... Uh, that's why people keep coming back, and then how do we build uh, an ad advertising model on top of that that strengthens it, that, that doesn't reinvent that, that takes exactly the essence of why that's powerful, and then allows you to extend it at such scale that you've never seen before. As uh, Twitter becomes more influential in interactive media, the temptation is to try to take advantage of that influence, and people may use tweet bots or other things to try to influence what the outcome of what Twitter is measuring. What do you do to defend against that? Yeah, we have one of our largest teams at Twitter is called Trust and Safety. I think it's over 40 people now. And all they do is look for and learn how to take down spam, how to protect users, and how to actually also make sure Twitter remains a very free and open platform. There's a lot of things we don't do uh, without an affidavit because, again, we're not the arbiters of uh, legality on Twitter. Um, so, yeah, we have a huge team just figuring that stuff out. When we did Dodge and Answer, we did an experiment in December, and we saw, um, of course, the Ron Paul folks. I heard you all back there. Uh, they were in there gaming like crazy, right? And we looked for that behavior, and then we had rules in place that absolutely minimized it so it couldn't have more than 1% impact. We basically, it was the number of tweets we would count per individual user in a certain amount of time. So there's lots of things you can do to kind of protect it against that, and it's pretty, you know, it's pretty uh, predictable. Um, but we have invested, I mean, our, we're 900 people, and so the Trust and Safety team, that's international, is a significant portion of that. And that commitment to making sure that we get rid of spam, that we understand and can see where bots are coming from, and think very aggressively about the health of the network is a real commitment for the company. My name is Sally Lehrman, and I'm looking at this from a journalism perspective. And I think journalism has experienced Twitter in both a very positive way, and it's also seen, seen as somewhat risky. So I'm wondering, in these new areas that you're talking about and moving into, what do you see as the landmines and the risks that people need to be aware of? 
as we step out of some of the traditional roles in our creative enterprises. Yeah, news organizations we spend, I, haven't, I don't focus on news as much here for this audience, but we have a whole news team working on our relationship with, with news organizations. They were some of the first people that I, I worked with in addition to TV networks. And the reason why is the news industry is undergoing such turmoil. Like and when you pick and choose who to play with and you need them to take innovation, innovative steps, look for who's in trouble and who needs to reinvent themselves. Because from the New York Times to the Washington Post, we've seen to CNN wonderful innovation in the news space. Um, I don't see as much of the risk, but that's probably because of the side I'm sitting on. I see a huge audience looking for news. Twitter is where news breaks. It is the new wire. I say that a little bit hyperbolically because we haven't yet really, we don't have a news wire on Twitter. But that's how every journalist I know, I hear stories day in, day out. The first thing they do is check their Twitter feed. It's where they go to see news breaks. And most news organizations have come to a healthy agreement. And we've gone, it's been amazing to see over two years the back and forth, the fear and the lockdown, and then now the acceptance, where you're now allowed at many major news organizations, you can tweet it uh, first, break it on Twitter first versus your site, because Twitter, you can do it that easily. It's harder to get a quick piece up on, say, NBC News or NewYorkTimes.com, as long as you send that internal email to all the editors saying, here's the news I'm reporting on. It's in the system. And then that next second, half a second later, you post it to Twitter. And I think that's a very healthy balance of recognizing you need to be first in news. You also need to be as, as correct and right as possible. So that's a constant tension. And we saw that with the Gabby Giffords reports, uh, misreporting her as dead on NPR and New York Times retweeting that. So there's, there's a tension to be first, but to also be right. And that did threaten the original model. But I think what everyone understands is Twitter's not going to write a long form piece about Gabby Giffords and what's happening you know, around, for instance, in the election. Uh, it's really going to direct to the best possible content. So. Break it on Twitter first, that's where you kind of have to earn your uh, marks as a news organization. But of course, people are going to redirect to get the full story on your site. Yeah. Pure, is it purely a journalism issue, or are you seeing this kind of tension and maybe resistance and conflict in some of the other fields like television? Um, oh, yeah, there's resistance everywhere. In fact, I would say news is less resistant. I think news has been the most um, interesting and fun partner to work with. I'd say news, then TV. Sports has been the hardest because it is, a, it is a business driven by licensing and money, not innovation. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of innovation in sports, too, but it comes from different pressure points and different opportunities. So news absolutely has been some of the most innovative. So yes, there's, but there's universal resistance to change. That's just normal human behavior. Uh, but the path, the distance we've gotten, the number of journalists on Twitter, uh, the amount of breaking news that happens on Twitter, the amount of live reporting that happens on Twitter, which is one of the things my team is focused on, Nick Kristof does a beautiful job. He'll be with Somali Man, and he'll be actually looking at, you know, he'll be in Cambodia with her looking, uh, live tweeting a raid on a brothel. And so now rather than reading about his piece, or in addition to reading about his piece on Sunday that gives me all the background around that, I can experience his fear, his perspective on the police coming, the girls, the whole story. I mean, that's a very different way to experience a news story. And it connects me to Nick Kristof in a way I never felt connected to before. So I think some of the interesting stuff that's happening is the rise of the journalist as, as more of a known entity uh, and more of a personality on Twitter. And if that's invested in, in the right way, I think that strengthens the company that actually has that stable of, of talent and artists like the New York Times. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about the global impact of Twitter? And I know that you're talking about a lot of um, activities that you're doing in the United States with television, but with the takedown in different countries and with blocking of words in different countries and you know Twitter not being in China except via VPNs, which is quite prevalent in and of itself, and Twitter's difference to say some of the Chinese microblog sites, uh, you can see around the world that I'm sure there's a lot of political tension around what Twitter could provide, what does provide. You know, how, how, do you, how do you justify this call for free speech and whatnot and, and what it is that you need to do to adhere to country laws? And I do think, by the way, that it's a good thing that you're doing that. But at the same time, I have an internal struggle with it as well, as I'm sure you guys did. Yeah, but I'd yeah. love to hear about that. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's something that the senior team has debated for years. And it's, it's an on, I mean, for anybody who does business internationally, this is a common tension. In fact, we have Tony, who runs our UK offices in the audience here, if anybody wants to chat about our, our European expansion. I think in the end, and this is going to be an ongoing conversation, I can't tell you how many thoughtful conversations our senior executives have had about this. I mean, I couldn't be more proud and absolutely um, 
in awe of how much time they spend trying to wrestle with this. And I don't think there is a perfect answer out there. I mean, there's plenty of ways you can say it's better to be in the country to have an influence, you know, even under the constraint, or do you, you know, remove yourself and let competitors bloom and not be able to play a role at all. I think it's just an extraordinarily challenge. What we did with the per-country takedown, this, this was uh, announced about a month ago, was the simplest, most transparent thing we could do, we thought, to grow effectively internationally and make sure Twitter is as accessible as possible. It's not up to a company, a private company, to change the laws of any country, right? You have to live and abide by the laws of those country. But how do you do that in a way that's as transparent as possible? So our rule is we take down content in a country only when we get a legal affidavit we make it very clear when we've been asked to take content down and we point to what content is taken down so that, again, outside of that country, you can understand what's going on. And we even basically help people in the country figure out how to go see that content by using off-country servers. So we're within the letter of the law. We're trying to be a good you know, company within these uh, new uh, areas that we're growing in, but we're trying to be as transparent as possible within the law to make sure everyone knows what's going on. And it's a way to allow us to grow in those countries while still keeping as much content available to everyone. So we might be asked to take down content in Turkey. That content is available to everyone else. And that was a big commitment to make sure we could engineer um, the solution to ensure maximum awareness, maximum exposure of the content, and as much transparency as possible as to when we do have a legal uh, request that we have to abide by. Change lives. Cambiar vidas. Change lives. Change organizations. Change organizations. Change, organizations. Change, organizations. Change the world.